Today we continue our dive into the Gloom Spike Gits by examining its leaders. At the top of the week I said I wanted to do uh, them all in their own special unique video because I thought it was important that uh, you need to see the range of models and units and the different kinds of insanity frankly that they're leading to really appreciate what they do. Because the real question is what type of cunning and malice and aggression does it take to lead this kind of army? And I feel like you only got that sense when you've looked at everything else. So today we're going to talk about the leaders, the loon bosses, the shaman, and more. But before that, I want to kind of jump back and do kind of cover a few things about all of them collectively and how they fit into the army. One thing I really want to drive home emphatically is that these are all grots. No matter their position or power, they still are the same as kind of the weaker cousins. They're small, cowardly, malicious, and cruel. They exude a kind of horrific type of humor, and they do so in a very tiny package. They're all boastful, overconfident, and filled with these delusions of grandeur. And as we talk about these units and what they do and how they add to the army, I want you to just never lose sight of that, because that's super important to the character of who they are. They may be heroes, but they're not heroic, if you know what I mean. At the same time, uh, kind of complementing their, their tiny size, they all have an ego, power, or charm to take the lead of those around them. Whether it's through inspiration or death threats, they're able to rally an army together. They are the originators of kind of that snowball growth of warbands that happen within a lurk layer as we talked about on day one. They forge packs between Spider Fang and Moon Clan. They choose the targets on the surface. They hear the bad moon itself. These are really the movers and shakers of a faction filled with character and lunacy. So in a sense, they're kind of both things, all right? They're both painfully average with all the same strengths and weaknesses of a normal Grot, but somehow they're also exceptional, able to kind of forge armies around them. And understanding that really sets the stage to talk about all of them. Now we're going to dive into the units, and as always, some of these have more lore than always, and uh, there isn't a whole lot of art for all of these specific individual smaller heroes, and so just I'm going to be showing random pictures just to kind of get through this. But I will certainly pick out the individual models to show you when I can. We're going to start off with the Loon Boss. Now there's three things it takes to make a Loon Boss out of, say, a Moon Clan Garot. You have to have luck, cunning, and the willingness to kill anyone in your way. Now, when I say kill anyone in your way, it's easy to think of very orc mentalities where you, you know, strike down the war boss and now you're the biggest and baddest. It's not just about physical acts of strength and might. A clever knife to the back of a rival is worth several punches in a fight. To that end, and their ability to survive and distrust everyone, loon bosses tend to be bigger, more brawny for grots. They're able to afford these really nice sets of armor. Uh, in vogue currently is the Loon Helm, which is the very iconic helm you see on the front cover of the book, the kind of crescent-shaped moon. And this acts as both a symbol of inspiration for his underlings, but also of authority. And once you become a Loon boss, really you have a lot of options available to you. You can lead on foot with the big teeming masses, absolutely, but you also get your choice of squigs from that particular scrap. You get the best ride there is. And if you're feeling particularly daring, you can hop on top of a mangler squig if you so desire. And one little tiny note here I want to bring in is the idea like they're not traditional champions. They're not as strong as other warriors. They're being strong for a grot doesn't actually mean much. It's a very low bar. But what they make up for in their lack of physical might is trickery. So things like hidden weapons or uh, kind of fainting moves and attacks, flanking forces, using nets, all that kind of stuff. There's one loon boss in the book who uh, he chucks exploding fungi at the enemy before attacking them. And so fundamentally the idea is how can I bring you down to my level? It's easier for a grot to bring you down to their level than for them to come up with a way to elevate themselves to being super strong. And now we move into the Gabapalooza. This is basically a, a council of wise grots, petty shaman, lunatics, and minor characters that really feed into kind of being, like I said, the council, the guard, assistance, if you will, of a loon boss or even a shaman, whatever, whoever's leading. They're all kind of morphed and twisted by fungal growths and magic. Now each scrap will likely have at least one of them as they make valuable assets on and off the battlefield. To put it simply, they're kind of support heroes, even though they don't have that keyword. And they're kind of listed as one bulk entry with like one or two sentences each, so I'll just rapid fire through them very fast. 
The first one is the Scaremonger, and this is one where uh, one Grot will dress up with a disguise of the sun itself. And the idea is that it's the sun riding out on the back of a squig. So you have the sun up top, you have the squig skull down below. And it represents the god beast Boingobs attempting to eat the rum of Hyish, and he burned for it. It's kind of like a cautionary tale given to all Moon Clan Grots about the fearing of the sun and things like that. And so waves of supernatural fear radiate off this character. The intention is to spook nearby Moon Clan Grots into running towards the enemy. It, it, it pushes them further into the fight. If you're a 40k fan, it's the kind of the equivalent of a commissar. He is scarier than what's in front of you, which tells you how they feel about the sun, quite frankly. Next up is the Brew Gits. And these characters lug around these massive brewing apparatuses into battle. They pump their comrades full of highly addicting but powerful brews to invigorate, empower, drive insane. Whatever needs to be done, they have a concoction that can do it. And so that's what they do. They bring that into battle with them and are doling it out to anyone near them. Spikers do something very similar, but instead of brewing things on the fly, they come into battle with a collection of venoms, which then they are happy to administer to the weapons of those around them. Again, sneakiness is kind of a reoccurring theme here, and this is their contribution to it, poisoning everyone's weapons. Next up is the Boggle Eye, and there's not really much explanation given here. They say he's sort of a shaman, he's not quite a full magic wielder, and his big deal is that he can hypnotize pretty much anyone nearby. When you get caught in his gaze, you become a drooling statue, and that's, that's pretty much it. Now, despite the kind of clarity in what he does, uh, on the tabletop, he's actually super incredible. He is a wizard. They say describe him as being not quite a wizard, but in the game terms, he is actually a wizard. Uh, and he knows the Mesmerize spell, which basically can give your troops battle shock, meaning he convinces them through mind control that they're, no, they're fine, they're brave, just keep fighting. Or he, if he does it against the enemy, he makes them basically play dumb and they fight last. So I don't usually bring uh, rule topics you know, rules and, and how that works into these videos, because it's mostly lore focused, but I felt like this is one that the rules actually gave us a greater understanding than the two sentences we got in the lore. And the last one in this group are the Shroom Mancers. And so uh, these are considered to be the oddest of all. They are um, user, users of magic that cause fungus to animate and they can commune with them. So basically how the rock gut trogots can wield and morph and, and kind of use rocks like a geomancer, they do the same thing with shrooms. They're able to direct where spore clouds are kind of spat and barfed up, and so that's how they kind of debuff the enemy. They can make clouds appear and mess with the enemy's accuracy or ability to fight. But now we transition away from that kind of clump of units, if you will, back into the more traditional stuff, and so we start back with the madcap shamans. These are the first true magic wielders, right? Real wizards as we would know them, and they can channel truly destructive energies. And they are good for obliterating enemies, but more importantly, in their own society, intimidating their rivals. And should the need arrive for them to boost their powers, they can always take a madcap mushroom, which instills a massive influx of power, as well as drug-induced visions and prophecies. And with this newfound power and power up, he can uh, devastate his enemies and any kind of competition he has from his side as well. And this all goes really well as long as he doesn't accidentally eat something called a madcap toadstool, which looks exactly identical as the madcap mushroom. Difference is it kind of turns his insides into mush. Gameplay wise, this is how you get the ability to boost your magic, but there's always a risk of eating the wrong kind of mushrooms and things backfire. Next up is one that we met during Malign Portance, that is the Fungoid Cave Shaman. They're also a wizard, but they act more as part of a grander religious authority than just a wizard, and as such, they're much more rare. These characters are truly seen as the mouthpiece of Mork, because Grotz, Oryx, Ogres, and Trogoths will all stop what they're doing to actually listen to this character. So if you ever need a reason for Grotz to be leading Oryx, say in this army they can ally with Bone Splitters, if you need a reason for that, a Fungoid Cave Shaman has it built into his lore that he can talk to anybody, and they all listen. And he will regale them with grand visions and prophecies of battles to be fought, slaughters to be had, meals to be eaten if he's trying to appeal to ogres. And this makes him the closest thing the faction has to a grand strategist because he's able to draw all kinds of sub-factions for a single campaign. So he's kind of a boss and kind of a wizard, but he certainly has more of a religious feel to him. 
And we saw this character in Malign Portents. There was a short story where he convinced a Moon Clan Grot leader, what we would now call Loon Boss, to gather up his army and go with him to Shaiish because that's where glory and fights were to be had. And when he gets there, he finds out that this cave shaman has been dumping off all kinds of destruction armies into Shaiish and collectively they are the ones who met at the gates of Nagashazar to try and burst their way and destroy Nagash when the Necroquake went down. So again, real movers and shakers. He has actually driven events in the main story arc. The appearance they have is due to them eating an extremely toxic mushroom called the Death Cap Shroom. And it causes fungus to grow internally as well as around them. So sometimes that will burst from their head. And that's actually what you see on the model from GW is this Death Cap Mushroom erupting from his skull. And so now we reach the last unit in this section, and that is certainly one of the coolest models we got. That is Scragrot, the Loon King. And right off the bat, the battle tome goes out of its way to say, nobody actually knows his origin story. Because he made sure that everyone who did, quote unquote, disappeared. But, uh, kind of catching him up, he is the current lord, if you will, of Scrappa Spill. Which is a big city, uh, I guess hive, you might say, lurk lair of Moon Clan, Grotz, and Spider Fang, all those things, the whole Gloom Spike Kits army located in the realm of metal. Now here's the thing that's unique about this. So most of these societies, these mega cities that Grotz can form, they tend to kind of collapse pretty quickly due to infighting, right? Some hero will raise and say, I know when the bad moon's coming and maybe he's right about that. So they'll all follow him for a bit, but if he doesn't keep predicting it or someone stabs him in the back, it kind of devolves and, and that's how they don't truly organize very well. Well, this society is a bit different because they have truly galvanized around Scragrot. The origins that he does share about himself is that one night, the Bad Moon spoke to him. It told him of his approach coming. And when he woke up from that dream, he had a massive headache. He felt his head and there was a new fungal growth that kind of looks like a crude crown upon his head. Next to him was a skull-headed wand and a staff with a Bad Loon boss fungus. This, if you look at the model, is the Crescent Moon Staff. That is what it's called. It's actually a particular type of fungus. And it's extremely rare. And it's an icon of authority and blessing. Well, as the Gloom Spite, this aggressive fever about the Bad Moon coming, took the city by storm, he asserted himself there as leader. And all the changes that had happened to him while he was sleeping, he has now become one of the most cunning grots and gained the power of a shaman. And the bad moon came just as he predicted. And when it did, he seized that moment and was able to annihilate several human and orc warbands near the city. This was a huge victory. People uh, absolutely loved him, but he didn't want to rest on his laurels because he was, again, more cunning than the rest. He knew that this power he was experiencing was fleeting. And so he set out to divine the next time the bad moon would be coming before someone usurped him, kind of re-cementing his power base again. But even according to his own origin story, he didn't do anything that initiated that dialogue with the Bad Moon. So the question is, how can I predict this next time? And that's when he built the Asylum. Easily one of the creepiest, most terrifying things, if you think about it too hard, things in the mortal realms. Deep beneath Scrappa Spill, there exists a realm gate. It's guarded by four armored Dankhold Trogoths. And this is a special realm gate. It has no name because it doesn't really go anywhere. When you walk inside of it, it leads to like an oubliette, which is like a, it's like a dead end pocket realm, if you will. Not super big. Well, after the events of Malign Portents, right, wizards, seers, prophets sprung up across the realms. People were having weird visions of things to come. Some of them were about the bad moon. And these people became Scragrot's single obsession. Through raids, attacks, kidnappings, he has collected a large amount of these people who were babbling all kinds of prophecies. The idea being, I'm going to collect them all in one place and they collectively will tell me when the bad moon is coming and I, because this place is secret, will go to the people and say, hey, the bad moon's coming and take credit for it. Well, if you resist being one of his people in his collection, uh, he'll walk up to you with his staff, again, the magical power of authority. He'll bonk you on the head three times with it, and your body begins to go through one of the most horrifically described transformations in any of these books. Your skin becomes rubbery, your limbs stop functioning, and you kind of warp in the most nasty body horror way into a giant living mushroom with a screaming face on it. And your face is still functioning. You can still talk, you can still scream, but your body is in agony, 
you've changed into a giant mushroom. Now the only thing that your brain is filled with is visions of the bad moons coming and the horror that it brings with it. And having this room full of these prophets and seers and wizards all babbling about the bad moon has actually given Scragrot the most impressive record of bad moon predictions to date. It cements him as an ongoing authority, true loon king of the gloom spite gets. He's made four such predictions of the bad moon passing, and each one of them has led to a great military win, so people have confidence in him. And again, it just kind of re-cements the, the bonds of all the sub-factions together. Trogoths know where they can get food, because when Scragorot says there's a fight, they trust him now. Spider Fangrots know that they can get food for the Arachnoroks, as well as get out there and mix it up in combat. And the Moon Clan Grots just see the Bad Moon coming and know they're going to collect all the shrooms across the realms. Like, he just appeals to every single one of the sub-factions with his accuracy and determination. Also, don't forget, somewhere there's just a room full of people who have been horrifically morphed by dark magic, who are just screaming in agony perpetually all the time. And so that is really it for all the leaders of the faction. So what makes them cool? Well, um, I think Scragrot is, is probably one of the most obvious ones where he doesn't need a, an in-depth backstory because none of these characters really do. Uh, it's all just kind of madness and lunacy until someone gets uppity and then they start taking the lead. But I like that he um, not only did the things that a normal loon boss would do, but he also went a step further about being cunning and being like, I understand the game, right? So he kind of removed himself and was like, I can't rest on my laurels. I have to find a way to make this like a product I can keep selling to everyone else. And so he made the asylum, which is super gross and unique, but it also shows just how absolutely BA he is as a character, that he understands the game he's stuck in, even though, according to him, the bad moon spoke to him. Like the, it was an outside force that initiated it, but he is now playing the game like a master. As for the Gobblepalooza, the collection of five heroes, uh, while they don't have individually a whole lot of lore, I would love to see um, small books come out from Black Library that really like, expand their roles and kind of give us a flavor of what they're like. Uh, truthfully speaking, though, I love the idea of entourages. Like, I love when a leader has, like, a small group of trusted advisors or a certain, like, cabal of wizards. Like, I love that kind of, like, second tier of leadership that gets things done. Uh, and I think that they fit into the army super well at that level. As for loon bosses, I love the fact that the battle tome took some time to really hash out the fact that they're not, for all of the the um, blessings and the great things they have going for them, they're really not physically impressive creatures. And that kind of emphasis on I'm going to bring you down to my level is something that saturates everything beneath them, right? Moon Clan, Garot, Squigs, everything wants to bring you down. In game terms, it's a lot of debuffs, but I mean, just in terms of temperament, it's so much easier to cut your knee and you come down to my level than I get on stilts and go up. And as for the fungoid cave shaman, uh, I mentioned his stories in Malay Importance. He's always been a cool character. Uh, I love the, the creepy voice, just the way he looks is so sinister. Uh, it really adds to the feel of the kind of the warping abilities of some of these mushrooms in the environment that they're in. So this faction has been super fun to cover and I do hope to do more videos for Gloom Spike Kids in the future. Uh, there's a lot more in this book and so this isn't the end, this is the end of the week obviously, but it's not necessarily the end of my coverage. I'll likely take a little break, but I'll come back to it in a little bit and explore some other stuff. But I want to ask you which of these heroes is your favorite. For me, it's Scragrot, just because the asylum is like the greatest kind of horror ever. I just love it. Uh, but the Fungoid Cave Shaman's a good close second. Tell me what yours are in the comments down below. I'd love to read it. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.